It's very nice to see you all. I am going to look at the bottom. My name is Kendra Kapelke, and I'm one of the editors of Passager. Passager is um, a made up word, by the way, even though it is also a French word. And it combines the word passages with the word passenger. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our donors, our subscribers, and all of those who share their writing with us, and, all, and everyone who buys our books and reads our journals and books. I'd also like to thank our hardworking board for sharing their time and talent and help helping Passenger grow. And to our community, which spans the globe, we couldn't exist without you. Your support enables us to share the wisdom and passion of older voices with the world. Passenger is committed to building community and continuing to find ways to make a beautiful space where we can live with intelligence, imagination, truth, and love. We publish Passenger, the journal, as well as books of poetry, memoir, and fiction, produce a weekly podcast, publish the pandemic diaries and more. Our website is easy to find, uh, passagerbooks.com. There's a link on the chat. We invite you to take a few minutes to poke around on our website and see the variety of things we have to offer. So let's take a minute to introduce our wonderful staff. Mary? Yeah, hi, I'm Mary. Mary Israel, and um, I'm co-editor of Passager, and um, my my job is to read poems and memoirs and short stories and all the work you send, and and uh, help make the decisions about what can go in the magazine. And often they're hard decisions, and uh, um, and we do the best we can to make a beautiful journal that. Where, pe where people will be happy together. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Christine Drawl. I'm Passenger's Managing Editor. I let it do a lot of things um, behind the curtains to keep us running um, all things logistical and technical. Um, Passenger has been a wonderful community to be a part of. You'll notice I'm probably the youngest here. Um, but just a lovely place to be among all of you people. Hi, I'm Roseanne Singer, uh, the assistant editor. I also do social media and communicate with writers, listeners, anybody who has questions, do some database work and uh, value being here a great deal. It's only been a couple of years, but it feels like being part of something. Hi, I'm John Shore. Uh, I am, uh, I produce and host Passager's weekly podcast, Burning Bright. Uh, a new episode comes out every Tuesday night at about 7.30. Uh, it features work from Passager writers, either people who have been in the journal or people who have uh, written books that Passenger has published. The, the podcast is short. It's five and a half to six and a half minutes. Not much of a commitment. Hope you'll tune in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So now to our writers. The writers today uh, all appear in the latest issue of Passenger, which many of you have. This beautiful cover painted by Tom Ritchie, who lives in Baltimore. We're really looking forward to actually seeing the writers, hearing them read, hearing their voices, and getting a glimpse of them. Each person is going to read the po uh, a poem or part of the prose that appears in the issue. And afterwards, if there's time, we can open it up to questions and conversation. We are expecting the program to conclude at 3.30. So now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first reader, Jean Nordhaus. Hello, I'm Jean Nordhaus. I'm originally from Baltimore, but I live in Washington 
DC now and have for a long time. So I'm not far from where I started. Uh, the poem I'm about to read had its genesis in the experience of giving away my husband's clothing after he died. It got me thinking about men and work and how important it was for men of a certain generation to learn how to properly tie a tie. And um, what else? There was a homeless man who was coming around looking for work around that time and he found his way into the poem as well. Elegy for the ties. The ties make me sad. Little flags of patterned silk hung in tidy rows behind the closet door. Stripes, chevrons, paisleys, fleur-de-lis, bright lilies of the field. I stuck them, I stuffed them down in the black bag with the dark tweeds and herring bones, pinstripes and gabardines, ruthless. I am ruthless. Perhaps these woolens in winters to come will warm the legs of a living man walking the streets with a cast in his eye, a wild song on his lips. November, dear fallen world, all color gone. Dead leaves pile along the curb to scatter in the wind. The lilies neither toil nor spin. Now who will loop the narrow end over and under the wide in that learned ritual of manhood? Who will smooth and snug the knot so the short end lies lightly behind the long? Our next reader is Kathy Shore. Hi, everybody. I can see it's snowing in some places. Well, here on Cape Cod, it's just the very first day of spring with the first crocus up as far as my life goes. Uh, this poem comes from the time my husband and I owned a house in rural Newfoundland. And Bert and Laura were two of our neighbors, elderly neighbors. Bert was quite well known for being a, a total grump. And we almost never were in his house, but this is an occasion when we were, and you can see, we were able to see another aspect of his life there. Bert's tree. Don't touch those apples, Bert yells at anybody turning down his lane. A wizened white haired terrier patrolling his domain. This tree he planted as a boy a year after the fire wiped out most of town when he was just three. Though it's hard to imagine Bert ever young, gnarled root hands, hardly able to hold a cup, crimson streaked cheeks from decades of rum. His wife, Laura, never steps off the porch. She was born old, neighbors tell us, bird-like, pecking at the raisin buns she bakes each afternoon for Bert. From the porch, she invites us into the too hot house, kerosene kitchen stove cranked. They try to teach us cribbage, previous scores with neighbors long gone, still on the paper pad. But the heat makes us drowse, content to watch the waves of Bonavista Bay out their back window beat against the jagged rocks. When we leave, it's almost dark. From the street, we see them framed in the dining room's bright light. Bert seated in his hard wooden chair, Laura standing over him, fingers exploring his scalp. And then she bends as if to smell the weathered creases of his neck, bends the way the apple-laden branches reach toward their sweet, familiar ground. Thank you very much. 
Our next reader here today is Rhett Watts. Welcome, Rhett. Thanks, Kathy. I'm Rhett from Central Mass, and it's fun to actually hear folks read their writing. My poem refers to slack tide, which is also called still water, the 30 minutes on either side of high or low tide where there's no movement, which I found an apt metaphor for the in-between space people like myself who live with chronic pain inhabit. The poem sort of um, ends with the memory of a time by the Rhode Island shore where my husband and I had a cottage that was my writing cottage for years. So this goes out to all those who suffer physical or mental pain at slack tide. The period of stillness just before the tide turns. Now that I no longer take long walks, he brings me things like the little green pine cone he found in the woods. It rests on my windowsill, a placeholder for all that is stunted and stunning. He puts his jacket on and I say, carry me with you here, my hand on his breast pocket. Smiling, he nods, then leaves, returns with tokens of the world. A blue action figure fallen to the street. A nest blown from the eaves of a barn he thinks he'd like to own. A stone so smooth you could wear it in your shoe. Once, when I was feeling utterly low, my eyes closed, he placed in my palm a knobbed welt shell, washed up onto the local mud flats. Its salmon colored insides opened me. And our next reader is Johanna DeMay. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Johanna DeMay and I am reading to you from my home in Albuquerque where uh, this is New Mexico in case you didn't know, <laughs> you Easterners. Uh, I work as a volunteer with the immigrant community and uh, I have watched how immigrant families preserve history and culture by sharing their family stories with their American born children. I'm also uh, a descendant, I'm a third generation American and in my family, we are still doing exactly the same thing. This poem describes an exchange between me and my young grandson, uh, who was completing a uh, classroom assignment. Oral history project. Fingers arched over his keyboard, my 11-year-old grandson, Aaron, calls me to the kitchen table. Where were you born? When? Family name? Hebrew name? Which relative came here first? Why? My father, just 14 when he ran away from Vitebsk to join the Russian army, fight in the Great War. They turned him away. He had hammer toes. Spiked eyebrows punctuate Aaron's surprise, like before and after question marks in Spanish. Yes, hidden toes, just like yours. With ordinary toes, he might have become a soldier, died on a foreign, on a frozen batter, battlefield. My gl grandson glances at his bare feet. What's your favorite memory of him? When we crossed the bay to Roqueta in a motorboat, he swam across. Mother muttered about riptides, jellyfish, sharks. Playful as a seal, he plunged through breakers, rose from the water, a shimmering merman bellowed, I'm hungry, let's eat. Keyboard forgotten, Aaron cracks his knuckles. What made great grandpa Sam so brave? I shrug, 
He survived a pogrom. How do you spell pogrom? Thank you. And now I'd love to inter introduce our next reader, Michelle Wolf. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, I'm Michelle Wolf, coming to you from uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, the poem I'm going to read today is called uh, My Mother's Mother. And I'd like to preface it by saying that caring for my mother during the three year period during which she uh, lost her mind truly to dementia uh, was one of the most harrowing times of my life. Um, during um, the course of, of her decline, she was often cantankerous and, um, uh, but there were also times when she was completely easygoing and companionable, companionable and came up with the most fanciful comments. And uh, so you'll hear some of these comments in, in the poem I'm about to read. I just wanted to mention that all the quotes in the poem are verbatim. So, my mother's mother. Just shoot me with a gun, my mother's mother, my clear-eyed mother's mother insisted, voice full of match heads ready to scratch, if I can't think straight anymore. Years before, in her, in her ruffled guest room, I had shared the droopy bed with my missing mother, then 27, her hair hit by lightning, branded with an ivory streak the night she had learned my father had died. My sister, who would also die young, bounced beside us in the cramped room, clinging to her crib rail. I clung to my grandparents. Most of all, I clung to my grandmother, who sang, I got rhythm, full blast, while scrubbing the dinner dishes. She held me up. I set down the phone numbness coating my throat and cottoning up my ears. I don't get mail, my mother at 77 insisted when asked about undeposited checks, the electric bill, phone bill. I don't get bills, she responded matter of factly. I don't pay rent. I got on a plane hot oil dripping inside my chest, my grandmother visiting again from the ICU, begging, take care of my dolly. Steeped in fumes, my mother was deep sucking 40 cigarettes a day. Soon, a scan of her brain would reveal a garden, cornflower blue lesions of decay that would in time have her forget to smoke, to recognize her family, speak, eat. For a long while though, she was chatty. Mom, remember those TV history shows you liked so much? I reminded her. That's more or less a Haitian thing, not a history thing, she replied. I don't have the Haitian ability now. And next up is Maureen Woodcock. Thank you. I'm Maureen Woodcock and I'm living in Cathedral City, California, but I come from Washington State on the Hood Canal, which is another inland sea. So it's quite a change for me here. I had another introduction sort of set up, but listening to you, your brilliant introductions, I'm gonna deviate just a little bit and explain that this piece of Japanese blowfish and a wooden suboy is really a story about how as a teenager uh, in 1960, I was following the election of Kennedy and I learned that he had a handicapped, Kennedy handicapped sister. And so I thought, well, if the Kennedys have handicapped people in their family, my family is okay. And then I happened to have a teacher, which involves in this long prose piece that I wrote, who turned out to be a beautiful, handsome neo-Nazi or Nazi eugenicist, and who proceeded to 
try to sell me his bill of goods. And that's really what the story of the Japanese uh, blowfish is all about. So when I entered high school, I couldn't decide if I was the center of the universe or simply an arrogant atom in some obscure God's coffee table. Because I was the eldest child and my mother had to work swing shift at Boeing, I was expected to pick up the slack at home. There were days when I was very impressed with how I met with my ability to manage the world. I could clean the house, feed my sisters, do my homework, mow the lawn, and follow debates over whether we should send a man, a monkey, or mice into outer space. Then there was a day when all my younger sisters tested my patience. Colleen, five, who possessed zero impulse, decided to lock one of the twins, Mike, three, in a suitcase. Valerie, 14, was my Irish twin because she was born less than a year than I was. Had another one of her psychotic nuclear core meltdowns. Plus mom, who was frugal and doled out food carefully, had once again remembered where she hid the bananas and expected me to make banana bread out of the rotten fruit. No wonder I was unprepared for my oral exam the next day. Even though I was weak in mathematics, I loved my science classes. As I looked through the lens of microscopes and telescopes, I was searching for God and the significance of my birth, what I, of my existence. I wanted proof that I was so important that I would have an impact on the way stars shone. I kept hoping and searching, even though, though I knew there was an equal chance of discovering I was just some small fizzle of energy, a dud in Apollo's fireworks. As much as I wanted to spend my time weighing empirical evidence versus supernatural forces, the practical world insisted I remain devoted to it. Finding a crowbar and getting Mickey Mike Pew, which was Colleen's nickname for the twin that was in prison, out of the suitcase came first. Grasping Mendel's laws of segregation and independent assortment came second. But my true goal and passion, finding the divine in a molecule or the Milky Way came last. And now I would like to introduce Craig Huckel. Thank you. I'm Craig and I live in the Washington DC area. Seven years ago, I stumbled across an interesting item on a State Department website. It said 81 year old man wants help telling his story. The man it turned out was Freddie Lee Wilson whose social worker wanted him to write his life story. But he didn't like to write. So we teamed up, an old black man with a story to tell and an old white man with a story to write. By the time Freddie died in 2020, we'd put the finishing touches on a draft of his memoir, Nobody Knows. Rivals for My Affection, which appears um, in the Passenger Journal, is one story within Freddie's larger story. The rivals are Barbara Ann, a white British woman he fell in love with in 1951 while stationed in England with the army. And the other is his dream of becoming a prize fighter. Here's an excerpt from our story, a story that always brought a smile to Freddie's face. I may have liked Barbara Ann, but she had a powerful rival for my affections, boxing. I'd been disappointed to learn that special services didn't have a boxing team in England like the one I'd been on in Japan, where I'd been undefeated. But my eyes lit up when I walked into the PX and saw a picture of two fighters, Joe Lewis and Ezard Charles on the cover of Ring Magazine. I dug a coin out of my pocket, slapped it on the counter and retreated to the barracks to reconnect with my heroes. Danny Womber was a lesser known black fighter who intrigued me. While working in an army kitchen during the war, Womber saw the special attention that athletes received and decided that he too wanted a helping. At the end of the war, he rejoined civilian life, not as a kitchen worker, but as a prize fighter who trained with Sugar Ray Robinson in New York City. Womber never was crowned champion, but he seemed to make a good living boxing outside the United States even fighting the British welterweight champion 
in Wales while I was in England. Barbara Ann gave me the confidence to dream about what tomorrow might look like. And Danny Wamber's example got me thinking about how I might put the pieces of my own life together. You know, my tour is up at the end of the year, I said to her one day. Makes me sad to think about, she interrupted. Are you gonna re-enlist? I could, I said, but I don't wanna keep driving road graders on airstrips. I wanna be a prize fighter. If I don't do it now, I never will. I knew how she felt because I felt the same way, but I had a plan. When I returned to the States and was, was discharged at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, I set out for the Mecca of the boxing world, New York City, where every neighborhood had its legends, James Braddock, Jake LaMotta, Sugar Ray, and many others. And fighters poured in from around the country and across the world hoping to fight under the bright lights at Yankee Stadium or the Polo Grounds or the greatest arena of them all, Madison Square Garden. Willie Pep, Joe Lewis, Henry Armstrong, Marcel Serdan, they'd all come to town chasing the dream. I too was chasing that dream. But as I made my way from the colored restroom past the colored, drink, colored drinking fountain into the colored waiting room of a South Carolina train station, might I have recalled my first train ride into London? Would I have remembered how the white railway workers treated me or how it felt to sit where I wanted? Would I have understood how the simple freedoms I'd enjoyed beyond the borders of my own country had inspired me to dream? And now that I was home, would I have paused to wonder whether dreams like records are made to be broken? The next reader, I believe, is, I don't see Milo Schaff. Hello, my name is Milo Schaff, and I'm reading from California. I am honored to participate. A few words about my poem. I received a shocking phone call that my 24-year-old son, a mountaineer, peace and conflict scholar, and veteran had just passed away. A few months later, I became desperate to know how people retained a sense of deep bonding with their dear ones. I reached out to friends and family who have experienced great losses. My poem, Rituals of Friends, is an attempt to share the spectrum of their approaches, perhaps providing a handhold for others who grieve. Rituals of Friends. I try each day, he whispers, to find color and light in the world again. For if I could unblind, my son is not gone. I wear Suzanne's clothes, she explains slowly. In her gloves, I feel her. And I talk to her children every week. And I talk to her grandchildren. He holds my arm. I have pictures of Phoebe, he says, beside candles, maybe 50. Sometimes I light all of them. Still, he holds my arm. When I meet someone, I describe Phoebe first. And I have a place where I watch for her, a sacred tree hidden among pines in Manzanita. They turn toward me and I want to tell them I keep his unwashed shirt. Alone, I breathe cotton and coils of memory. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Kim Stamen. Uh, I'm Kim and I'm um, coming to you from Seattle. And I, like most writers, um, tend to eavesdrop. Um, this is a warning. <laughs> Um, so I overheard the first line of, uh, of this story in a pancake house near the SeaTac International Airport. And I guess just the combination of the setting and this first line um, instantly gave me a story. So this is just the first bit of the music of Copenhagen. 
You will be in my thoughts, said the young man. Ebb ate his thick restaurant pancakes. He knew it was 1985 and the young man across from him was going to Copenhagen with his two dogs. He did not remember how he knew. I brought you a jigsaw puzzle. The young man slid a wrapped package across the table, his dark curls bouncing. No one takes dogs to Copenhagen unless they plan on staying there a long time. Ebb knew this. The young man, not his son, his son had gray hair now, was leaving forever. Who was he? He couldn't remember. But the waitress's name was Midge. She had a badge on her left chest. Midge was the stout one. She came to the table and poured more coffee. The red on her nails was peeling off. By this time tomorrow, I'll be there. This time tomorrow, I'll be phoning you. Ebb looked up, surprised. He checked his watch. No, no, tomorrow, this time tomorrow. Ebb went back to his plate. He gripped his fork as if it were important. He'd driven here slowly to the pancake house near the airport, wearing his flat brown hat frayed at the creases and feeling for the break. He usually came here Tuesdays, not Saturdays. Saturdays were too crowded. They have different money there, said the young man. Have you ever seen it? He leaned sideways, getting something out of his back pocket. Look, pretty crazy, huh? He handed over some crisp notes of watery blue, green, and orange. Hmm. Ebb didn't know what to do with the money. He wasn't going to Copenhagen. The only time he'd been outside the country was during the war. He wasn't familiar with people going outside the country voluntarily. I have to be at the airport in an hour and 15 minutes. Ebb immediately put his hands on the table and began pushing himself out of his seat. No, no, I've got plenty of time. I wanted to sit and relax with you a bit. Ebb settled back down in his booth. They sat in silence for a while. The young man unwrapped the gift and showed him the jigsaw, tall pastel buildings along a canal, squashed and leaning from age, lined up like tipsy soldiers, their colors reflecting in the calm water. Midge took their plates. You could still change your mind, said the young man. And from there, the story takes a bit of a surprising turn. So I hope you'll have a look at the rest of it in this beautiful journal. And the next reader is Reba Taylor. Thank you, Kim. Uh, hi, I'm Reba, and I um, had to write my intro so I wouldn't keep digressing. Um, I wanted to say that I'm really honored and delighted to be here with all of you and our, um, our listeners, our audience. Um, it's exciting, too. I'm in California. Uh, just north of LA at my mother's house. The excerpt I'm going to read to you is um, from a collage piece. It's a collection of lyric shorts uh, that chronicles a handful of moments from the fall of 2020 when I began spending five nights a week at my mom's and two nights at my home in Palm Springs until I traveled back to her house in late November and understood I could no longer leave her there alone. So I stayed. Uh, it was really hard for me to select the parts to read. Um, and I, uh, Kim sort of stole my little line about plugging the beautiful journal. I hope that you will read the whole piece because um, together these little vignettes um, create this feeling of the time for me um, better than, than just the little bit that I'll be reading to you now. It's called Crossings. I have no real harbor here. She sets the thermostat at 80 degrees and I endure suffocating heat. 
Outside can be a haven, my book, my kombucha, my pile of newspapers, until she decides to come smoke out there beside me. I take to hiding food in my bathroom to keep her from eating it before dinner or from putting it back in the fridge. She turns off the stove or the oven when I'm out of the room, so dinner is delayed. Today, she forgets three times to put the curtain down and open the doors before she smokes, and I run through poisoned air to open up the house. I don't know how to solve any of this. I know these must all be part of her compulsion to order her physical world, but they still feel like violation, like assault, like living proof of no boundaries between us. All these decades, I thought that was my fault. And now I wonder if it was always impossible. And it reminds me of how she puts away my tea bags, my box of dates, my favorite cup, as soon as I go home, as if as soon as I go home, she needs to remove all evidence of me. At home, I sweep my courtyard, make big piles of bougainvillea blossoms and empty sunflower seed shells and dark desert sand from what must have been a big wind when I was away. I look for my dead lizard friend who I shrouded in a big mullein leaf from my garden, but he is nowhere to be seen. Last week, I stood on the step stool to look for him before I opened the shed door and I didn't see him there, but I forgot to knock to be sure to startle him away and he died because of me. He was my friend. like the hummingbird who comes to sit on the open louvers in the living room is my friend, and I killed him. For a moment, when I held him in my palm as he died, I felt like he was one of the only friends I had. I lie in bed at my mother's and listen to the rain through the open windows, quiet and steady. I picture myself grieving in this house when my mother is dead. For one swift moment, I understand being able to be here is a gift. I understand it is an honor to shepherd her through this time, and I cry. And now it's my pleasure to um, let you get to hear Joe Pacheco. Thank you. No more heavy poems. I know that I am long past due for a serious poem. Flirting round with country won't ever bring one home. But the older I get, the younger I see. No more heavy poems coming out of me. So I'm cashing in my chips and switching o'er to verse. Call me Nona Papi or poet in reverse, cause the older I get, the younger I see. No more heavy poems coming out of me. You've got to be serious, some fellow poets exclaim. Poetry and gravity are keys to laureate fame. Cause the older you get, the clearer you will see why you need those heavy poems pouring out of thee. I'll sell my stash for Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson sound. A poem's no fun when it weighs a ton and its feet stay on the ground. So the older I get, the lighter I must be. No more heavy poems coming out of me. I'm writing no more stanzas, recounting all my woes, going back and forth and over to wherever undergoes. The only song you'll hear from me 
from this moment on, give thanks everybody. My heavy days are gone. The older I get, the lighter I must be. No more heavy poems coming out of me. Oh, and now, Roberta Shine. Hi, I'm Roberta, and I'm in my apartment in New York City. The title of my story is Toto and Maritelma. As soon as I picked up the phone, I heard the panic in my friend Maritelma's voice. Toto está enfermo. Toto is sick, she said. He isn't eating and he has severe diarrhea. I have to call, I have to bring him to the hospital right away. How do I call a lift? I told her I'd arrange for the ride. It was faster that way. Toto is a parrot, an 18 year old African gray parrot. An hour later, Maritelma texted me from the Animal Medical Center. Clearly she was still upset. Toto has to stay here for at least two nights. They're giving him antibiotics and tomorrow an exotic animal specialist will be coming to give him a CAT scan. But the worst part is he has a heart condition, they call it arrhythmia. And they keep telling me over and over that he can die. I told her to call as soon as she got home. Then came this. I never liked that bird. Followed by, he bites me and he's bossy. And if I put bird food in his cage, he throws it on the floor so I have to cook for him. And he repeats everything I say, but in this mean ear piercing voice. My ex got him for me 18 years ago in that exotic bird store when it was on Bleecker Street. Believe me, I had known that he was such, had such a rotten personality, I would have chosen another bird. But still, it makes me sad to leave him here overnight. He's gonna be scared and well, waking up in the morning without Totito there. It's gonna be sad. Oh, Maritama, it doesn't matter that Toto is bossy and throws his food on the floor and squawks at you all day. He's in his, your heart. You love him and you don't have to justify it just because he's, well, obnoxious. You and Toto, you're a grumpy old couple. And I understand because of my grandfather. Grandpa Sam said exactly what was on his mind and was sometimes downright nasty. He always had a cigar in his mouth and he would say to people, does the cigar smoke bother you? Because if it does, you can leave the room. Everybody complained complained about him, but late in his life, I cracked the code. Suddenly I could see into his heart and it was filled with love. Now I'm able to choose friends who many people overlook. You have that skill too, Maritelma. I've always known that about you. A few days later, Toto came home. As soon as Maritelma opened his travel box, he flew to her shoulder and began singing softly. Her messages have lightened up also. She's even able to joke about the situation. Totito's caca is normal, she announced the other day. I'm gonna call the New York Times. And now I'd like to introduce the stars of my story, Toto and Maritelma. Hello, this is Totito, and I am Maritelma. <laughs> and the next reader is Susan Carlson. Hi, everyone. 
I'm Susan Carlson, and I'm reading from my home here in Dexter, Michigan. And over the past couple of years, when so many writing workshops became available online, I um, had the opportunity to learn from and to write with poets from around the world in a way that I would not have had otherwise. And the poem I'm going to read today, It's Not Like a Dance, is a poem that was born of one of those workshops. And to my delay, is the first poem of mine that was accepted for a publication in Passager. It's not like a dance, it's a war. It's carnage and alliance. It's devastation and always the call to more. I could make the argument that every man is a soldier left behind. I could make the argument that every field is a falling place and there's a submarine powering a battle on every shore. Think about your father and the girl from whom you labored free. We all start out that way. I was born to have someone inhabit me. I was born to house a beat stronger than a distant drum because thrum demands more of splay than what it calls to muscle through. It's not a waltz, it's a wire. It cuts, it binds, we bleed. We want it that way, want to wage ourselves against ourselves, to be spent bold before subjugation, left for scent and sheen, for the residue of what keeps us coming back until we're through. Thank you. And our next reader is Stephen Holloway. Hi, I'm Stephen Holloway. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from a memoir piece titled Finding Mom. Uh, in 1965, I was 12 and living in Tokyo with missionary parents. And uh, one day, my father took my mother to a hospital in the States and left us three kids with uh, an another old lady missionary as kind of our babysitter. I assumed that mom had gone home to die. She had been very sick and getting worse. Unless that hospital in Richmond could work miracles, she wouldn't be coming back to Japan. Would dad be coming back for us? Surely he would, even if it was just to fetch us for the funeral. But we never told anyone at school that we were living without a parent at home. There would be too much to explain. And we didn't know how to explain it. Dad did return and he told us mom was going to get better, but uh, you know he had no idea that I thought she was dying. I never told him, but dad said better did not mean that she could still be a missionary. We were going to have to leave Japan forever. I was born in Japan. Tokyo was the only home I knew my dad was gonna lose his job because mom was sick. I was afraid that we would be poor. All my progress in the seventh grade, you know, my buddies, my girlfriends, my class rank, my singing, my good feelings about myself, it was all going to fade away like it never happened. Somehow I had not let mom darken my days at school, but now, she was going to be my whole life in a strange place. A month later, we walked into Tucker Hospital in Richmond, noticing that it was an older building, but it didn't smell bad like most hospitals I'd been in. I didn't have any idea what to expect. I knew mom was still alive, but I didn't know what she was recovering from. As dad and us three kids were led toward mom's room, I saw that there were a number of large rooms like I'd never seen in a hospital. There were a lot of ladies mom's age in street clothes playing cards as if this was a clubhouse. And sometime between that point and entering mom's room, it dawned on me that this was a mental hospital. The thought was disorienting. 
All the time she was gone, I imagined her in a hospital gown with tubes and monitors being treated for something that could kill her. But here she was talking with ladies with nothing wrong except what was in their minds. Too sad to go home again or too confused to navigate the real world. A mental hospital. Every person who knew had been ashamed to tell me, not least my father. I have some sympathy for him now, since everyone treated mental illness as a terrible secret, which made your whole family suspect. But at the time, it just made me mad that they let me think for so long she was dying. She wasn't dying. She was crazy. Mom had been so bad the last time I saw her that I held in my mind a picture of her before she got sick, not the body in the hallway or the woman seizing. And when I finally saw her now, it was obvious she was heavier, but I couldn't figure out the darkness about the eyes. When she greeted us with hugs, I had the vague feeling she was play acting. She placed one hand on top of my head and said, my, how you've grown in a tone that you would use with a nephew. I had stretched out the last couple of months, but I wondered what she was comparing me to. What was the last time she actually remembered being with me? A couple of days later, she admitted she was actually worried about her memory. They'd given her shock treatments, which wiped out some of her memories. She didn't go into how painful they were, but sometimes when we were riding in the car, she would go into aftershocks, jerking, not in a seizure, but as if electricity were flowing through her body again. I'd never seen anything about shock treatments in the movies at that point. The only image I had was Frankenstein's monster all wired up. It made no sense to me that this would help her not to be sad. Thank you. Uh, the next reader is Bonnie Jacobson. Hello. Uh, it's very nice to be here among the elderly and all you who hope to be elderly. Uh, I'm 88 and I hope to be 89. Uh, I live in Cleveland, Ohio, actually uh, Beechwood, which is a suburb of Cleveland. Uh, and my poem is called The Mystery of Food and Thought. It's a sonnet among about a hundred other sonnets that I've written in my lifetime. The Mystery of Food and Thought. I don't know how to live and so I just do it, eating my egg a day as if it were the first egg of my life or the last. Coffee and toast as great an astonishment. Any hunger strike is conviction I cannot imagine, while imposed starvation is evil way beyond Satan in that silly red satin bodysuit. And though my mind has rummaged through a dustbin of possibilities, it will never understand why it must eat in order to save it and praise. Thank you. And now our next passenger reader is Dorothy Reem. Hi, um, I'm Dorothy, and um, I live in Northampton, Massachusetts, in a co-housing community here. Uh, this is beautiful Western Massachusetts, not too far from the Berkshires. Um, the poem I'm going to read um, is a very simple poem about memories of childhood uh, of my growing up in North Dakota. 
um, it's sort of set um, uh, just on an ordinary summer day, sitting on a swing in the backyard of our of my parents' home. It's called Taking the Light. Here, under a sun that made nothing old or poor, the long day spread in a changing green wonder of shadows as I sang the summer afternoon away. Safe in the kind town where people lived their quiet lives and let me be Tarzan on my swing or Guinevere, ruler of the birds and the sky and the trees. Here, my father planted love in the dark soil of our garden. Invisible in the blue air, it grew, turning sunlight on inside of leaves. It was wind whispering secrets in our old elm, this mysterious air I breathed. Now, with the murmur of that world far away, I listen to the trees, remembering voices of women like birds talking among themselves all afternoon in the leaves. Then evening voices of men, like the chirping comfort of crickets. Happiness is hard to say, but I know it takes the light like leaves and gives it back again, shines in a similar kind of air. And our next reader, is Tracy Lewis. Hello, everybody. I'm Tracy Lewis. I live in Liverpool, New York, uh, where it has been snowing and uh, uh, where I am a retired professor of Spanish. I'm an adoptee who likely began as the unintended consequence of a less than ideal encounter between a man and a woman. Though I've known all my life that I was adopted, I did not find out the identity of my biological parents until I was over 70. And I still know little of the circumstances that led to my existence. Aging love child looks ahead, reflects on the question marks that have hung over me all my life. It's also a meditation on the transition we all face when life expires and morphs into something else. Aging love child looks ahead. In the fullness of time, which is to say in the fullness of space, this body bequeathed me by strangers in a back seat by the tracks, or a rented bed by a vacancy sign will let go its lifeline of days and simply float in placid dissolution. And what was fullness of pen and muscle in the pulsing docket of clockworks and suns will be new emptiness waiting to be filled. And that I believe concludes our passenger reading. So back to Kendra. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you, everyone. That was a wonderful reading. Just wonderful. Um, I would recommend that you all unmute yourselves and give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Um, anyone, do any of you want to make any comments? It I, is I just thought listening was so moving. Everybody's piece was just so moving and touching and delightful. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I just want to get together for a big dinner so we can all just <laughs> sit around and talk and <laughs> get to know right. more about each other. Thanks to Kendra and Mary for a beautiful, beautiful issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just say congrats to everybody for what great reading performances. I mean, 
I'm just stunned at the the quality of, of everybody's uh, reading technique, and uh, not to mention the the quality of the of the writing. Just wonderful. So great to be so proud to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we had good conductors between you know the staff, Kendra and John. I mean, really, were great. When you were blanked out, but you could hear how we were being guided through this. So it was lovely, very helpful. Yeah, we had for those of you that are listening, we and watching, we had a tech rehearsal, mm -hmm. which is something you have to do on Zoom that you wouldn't do in real life. Um, in real life, you just kind of pray that everyone <laughs> reads well. Um, and in, on Zoom, you get the opportunity also to meet, you know, to become a kind of group. And I'm always trying to hear, you know, what does passenger sound like? Like what, how does it sound? How does this issue mm. sound? And how does the last issue sound? And because as we're making it um, and putting it together, it starts to create its own life. But that's not a life we can see until we're in the act of, um, you know, assembling it. And then when we assemble all of you together, it creates yet a different sound. And I, you know, thinking about the pandemic too, and just um, these are the songs that we're singing during this time. I'm just curious, could I ask a question? Um, when you set out um, to publish Passager, to bring an idea in onto the page, did you envision that it would turn out to be anything like what it has? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think when we began it, we had a very strong urge and the urge took over um, that voices, I mean, I was 29 at the time and not near, you know, it was for 50 and older. So 50 seemed a long way off. Mm -hmm. And now it seems a long way back, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> like, what? what, 50? You know, the people, the people we publish are 70, 80, 90, 100. Easy. Um, and My children are 50. Exactly. Exactly. Right. 50 is nothing. I mean, nothing against 50 year olds. But, but also back 30 years ago, 50 was considered older. You know, it, it wasn't just our own thinking. It was the thinking of the culture. I mean, the thinking has changed so much in the last 30 years. But, you know, we really, I think the mission was a combination of a kind of um, filling, putting something in the world that would say something about being a writer, being an older writer, um, that was not in any, it didn't exist at all. I still don't think it exists very much. Um, mm. And discover, discover for ourselves our own voice, because as we know, our voice changes throughout our lives. And Passager could be a place where someone could continue to publish. Um, so that was the initial impulse to bring old age, which is even a word, who knows if we should say that, but age into the literary journal scene. Um, new older writers, new people that are writing for the first time because they're newly free. Mm -hmm. People that are discovering they have things they want to say. There's a new sense of urgency. Um, so now where we are, Mary, jump at any time because, it, well, first of all, who could have predicted the pandemic, um, what it would do to passenger? But creating a creating space, something, and I, you know, I said that at the beginning, something beautiful. When I worked at the senior center when I was 25, we stapled together, you know, when we finished our class, we stapled a journal together. 
And I, I know for me, it felt very ingrown and in home, but we wanted something really beautiful and really professional yeah. and very high quality and getting, you know, everything about passenger, we want to say that the people matter. You know, when we first published, we had the picture of the author on the page with the quote, because we wanted it to inspire other people mm. to write. I, I'm sure I'm giving, you know, I, I can't imagine leaving this reading today and not thinking there's so much I want to write about. <laughs> Just hearing everyone and thinking about where your own imagination <laughs> would go. Um, I have a different kind of question um, <clears throat> because I was, I know poetry started as an oral tradition, and, but I was a commercial artist for about 35 years. And to me, it's very important to see how the poem uh, looks on the page. There, I remember ragging copy when I was a layout artist, and it has to look right on the page. Does anybody else uh, suffer from this? <laughs> why, why do you say suffer? <laughs> <laughs> well, it should sound good, and sometimes I, I err in the direction of looking good. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree entirely. I mean, I spent four years in the arts. I had begun as a writer and discovered that wasn't particularly compatible with family raising children, but yes. I could work as an artist and still manage to keep family life balanced. Yeah. And that's what I did for 40 years. And as soon as I retired, I went right back into, I had continued to write, <clears throat> but I never shared anything. And once I retired, I started sharing work and it matters a great deal to me how it looks because yes. of my life dedicated to making things visual. And uh, so I understand exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. We balance, you know, we juggle all of those demands. It has to, first of all, it's got to say something. <laughs> and and yeah. second of all, it's got to sound beautiful, but most people aren't going to hear us. If we're lucky, they might see it. So it's got to look right. And yeah. so I with you entirely. Yeah. Interesting. That, that, was really, that was one of the gifts of the pandemic for, um, because we, we started to have these uh, readings on, on Zoom where we brought people together from all over the world even. And you know, people who, readers who had seen the work on the page got to experience it on the voice of the person who wrote it. And yeah. I, I was feeling that so much today because I've, I've, you know, I know your work really well. I've read it many times and loved it just without you there and your voice and just to hear what you said about it before you started talking. And then when you read, it just came fully alive, but I agree. I mean, I think you need, it's not an either or, but I agree, your voice is a big part of it. You did beautifully, all of you, really. Thank you. Thank you. I had a problem when I was 75 on my 75th birthday. I wrote a poem playing out my last quarter. And oh. now I'm 91. <laughs> and uh, you cycle the poem. Now I have to write playing out my last decade. And I'm afraid <laughs> to do that because I might give myself a jinx. But, uh, I decided I decided long ago that uh, my poetry should lives better when it's performed by me. Mm. And I've been I've been on NPR several times. I've been performing my poetry uh, quite a bit in my later years. And uh, although the printed page is very important for poetry, I think the poetry is best 
with an audience um, that appreciates poetry and a poet that knows how to make it, turn it into sound that's lively and meaningful. Yes, but Joe, there, a poet is sometimes a person who sits alone in a room because they're actually very shy and prefer to sit alone in a room. And, and reading aloud to an audience is sometimes difficult for that kind of person. Well, I remember it wasn't long ago when we, in the 50s, when I was sort of young anyway, <laughs> you, you weren't in, me, in academia, in many colleges. Mm -hmm. They wanted poets who could read almost in a monotone yeah. and, and mm -hmm. not try to uh, bastardize yeah. a printed page by acting it out. That's for actors. The poem, uh, the poet function was to read uh, at a reading out loud exactly what he wrote on the printed page and not try to act it out. That was actually a popular view. Of course, there were many that didn't agree with that, thank God. So <laughs> we would have had Dylan Thomas and some of the other great readers of that time. But it, 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 it really existed in academia on the printed page mm -hmm. and how many uh, chapbooks you had written and didn't exist for live audiences to get wowed or react in any kind of unseemly way. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and, I, I and think- no you more know, heavy uh, poems tries to deal with that anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's it's poetry is both things. I mean, I, I think uh, uh, the fantastic, the, the great poetic genius uh, Neruda. Uh, I, what I've seen of his his performance of his poetry is really leaves a lot to be desired. Because, uh, but you know, in print, I mean, it's just it's it, there. You can't describe it. It's so wonderful. Right. Uh, yeah, so. I'm, but it's come around to become a performance art. And I, I'm with yeah. Joe on that. It's a performance <laughs> art. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, we poets, we, we compete with, uh, with singers, uh, but we ought to be performing our poetry as if we're singers. Uh, we're performing with the voice as well as on the page. Um, but remember that at the same time we had Neruda, we probably didn't read his poetry. It's, it's the greatest poetry uh, yeah. uh, probably written in the last hundred years in Spanish. We also Amen. had Borges. Borges yes. performed yes. poetry in New York City, where I'm from, at the YMH. He performed it several times. And he was a, a master of not only performing his poetry, but also his short uh, pieces of prose and all of that. So uh, although some poets themselves write great poetry, but don't read it, don't do it justice. Uh, I, I think the best thing for a poet is to think of his poem as a living thing orally and imagine oh. an audience hearing it rather than reading it. I wish I could hear Shakespeare reading his sonnets. <laughs> it could have been dull because some, some of the best poets have been terrible readers. <laughs> but I think Leonard Cohen was a poet that turned to music and used poetry. I mean, you know, I know that in music we have this constant repetition, you know, you'll find a, a verse, but I still think that he did a good job of that. And uh, went back to writing more poetry as he got older and uh, to what his first love was. So I don't think you can take the art of picture or painting or the alignment of lines or the music, you know, away. I think it's, it's whatever, whatever plucks the strings of our heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Let me uh, jump in for a minute just to say that um, we'll continue this conversation. Um, it's a wonderful conversation. If any of you um, are interested in buying another copy of Passenger, I just want you to know that we have 20 copies left. Wow. We are, wow. We are down to, we're very excited. We're, you know, but I just wanted you to know. Yippee. I know. Is that because we're going to make more or that's it? No, we can't. We can't make more, but it's because of all of you. It's just going out the door like hotcakes. Okay. So, Congratulations. So let us wow. know. Yeah. Um, the other point I just quickly want to make is that um, if you're, you know, we're trying to, the pandemic has really taught us how to reach people. I mean, it's helped us to reach more people. I think people think of publishers as, in, a, as a kind of place, but not people. Um, they're the publishers, but we really do want you to stick around with, you know, if, if, if we want to make sure you know you that you're welcome to stick around with Passenger in all kinds of ways, if you want to contribute to the pandemic diaries or whatever, but um, really think of us as a place to even offer your own ideas and suggestions for things, your feedback. Um, we welcome it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've known some of our writers now 30 years, huh? 25 years, you know, it means a lot to us. Um, that gives me good chills, Kendra, that's so dear. Yeah. <coughs> well, you know, this issue is dedicated to Jean Connor, who died in November uh, at the age of 100 and, I don't know, two. one, two, two. 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 Two, yeah. And she, we published her first book when she was 86. <laughs> and I mean, talk about, whoa, whoa, here <laughs> we go. You know, like that just went boom for her and for us. She, you know, the, the coolest thing about her, one of the cool, many cool things about her, but one thing was that getting interviewed made her brain have to answer questions about her process, about how she thought about poetry. No one had asked her these things. You know, we don't get asked these questions. And so we don't necessarily have to think about what is what it is we're doing. But Jean felt so grateful for that. She just said, thank you. I feel like I'm getting another college education, <laughs> just having to learn how I think. Right. You know? Yep. Um, so anyway, she went on to publish, you know, more books and had a whole new life as a poet. Yeah, she became known as a poet in her late 80s. She became known as a poet in Vermont and quite, became quite famous there. She did. Um, and it was Passenger's first book, too, by the way. Mm. We, we decided to publish books because we had her, some of her poems from submitted for the contest and they were just amazing. So I wanted to say something about um, acting out, reading our poems beautifully and um, kind of acting them out. Um, I remember being criticized for acting my poems out or my, my stories out in a writing class that I was in and told the words should carry it. And as a new writer, you need to learn how to get everything across through the words and not to rely on, you know, uh, acting it out or changing your voice or uh, smiling at the right time or making a funny face or whatever. Um, <laughs> so at that time, I, uh, I think it, it helped me a lot to just really tone it down and read things in a monotone. I just want to say something for that side of the argument. I don't feel that way anymore. Pausing for line breaks was always uh, controversial too. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, there's a there's a difference. Every every medium is different and has strengths and weaknesses, and print is is great for certain things. And, mm -hmm. and when you write for the page. You do it a certain way to take advantage of those strengths. 
But when you're listening to something, there are strengths and weaknesses to oral communication as well, or emotion or whatever it is. And so I think one of, one of the dilemmas for us as writers and as readers is thinking about how we can best communicate our ideas or one piece of work, a piece of work from one medium in another medium. And as, as the podcast producer, I'm always having to think about that. Mm. Something that works really well on the page doesn't always translate to sound in the same way. Right. I've had, to, I've had to forego reading certain pieces that I really like. Yeah, yes. Because I tried it and they just didn't work, good as they were. Well, I, I would luckily, because in Spanish, when my mother would take me to the Spanish theater sometimes, they had declamadores, people who performed poetry. And that was their profession. And they used to do it on buses in public and perform poetry. So for them, there wasn't a printed page. There was in their oral memory. Mm -hmm. So I, I realized very early at a very early age that poetry didn't just have to be read, but it had to be, couldn't be acted out. And it was even better when you acted it out than when you read it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I try to act out my poetry. In Cleveland, uh, we have a poetry association and we united with other art uh, places in the zoo and the uh, symphony, et cetera. And, but we hired uh, actors to perform the pieces right. that were chosen. Right. They do that all over New York, Meryl Streep, and um, <laughs> yeah. Cynthia Nixon. Yeah. They do, they perform other people's poetry, you know, they're actors. Mm -hmm. And they're really good at performing other people's poetry, it's not theirs. That's another thing. Mm. Mm. Well, any final comments before we have to say goodbye? I just want to say thank you to, to uh, Passenger to, for, um, for your mission of giving us a voice. Um, <clears throat> I, I have, as an older person, I haven't always <clears throat> felt uh, that I got the reception from many, many journals uh, that uh, my age, uh, I thought, <laughs> merited. Um, uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, muchas gracias. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it just... Uh, uh, this is wonderful, and, and the opportunity to do this and meet all of you as well uh, is just a bonus. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you all. You really were a wonderful group. <clears throat> thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.